Good evening. Our lesson this evening will be on living the mystical life or the mystical way of life. And in order to do this, we must first of all take away the mystery connected with that word mysticism. Actually, there is no mystery about mysticism, but unfortunately, one of our major dictionaries has for several generations carried an erroneous definition of mysticism, and at this late date, they probably cannot acknowledge their wrongness by changing it. Therefore, if you wish to know the real meaning of mysticism, you will have to refer to Webster's Dictionary. And there you will discover that there is no mystery about it. Mysticism is any teaching that teaches direct or the ability to have direct communion with God, the ability to pray to God and receive answer, the ability to have direct contact with God. And of course, this must include Christianity because Christianity does believe in the ability to have communion. It does believe in the ability to pray and receive answer. But to live the mystical life, it becomes necessary to understand the part that we play in the experience. The Master, Christ Jesus, taught throughout his entire ministry how to prepare for the experience. He taught the need for prayer, for communion, for meditation, going away often for long periods to commune inwardly with his father, your father and my father. He taught that you cannot add to a vessel already full, that you must purify the temple of your being in order to make room for God to enter. You must forgive if you would be forgiven. You must be benevolent, charitable. You must comfort the comfortless, visit the prisoner in his prison, whether it is a jail prison or the prison of sin or the prison of disease or the prison of unhappiness, you must visit with spiritual vision and comfort your neighbor in his or her particular prison. You must share food and clothing and housing. You must serve even the least of these, my brethren. You must heal the sick. You must feed the hungry. <clears throat> Certainly, you must free all those whom you may have held in bondage, help to free those who are holding themselves in bondage, and certainly help to free those 
who are being held in bondage. So you see that the responsibility is not all God's. The first responsibility in living the life of prayer, the life of the spirit, the mystical life, is the preparation When you think back on the woman taken in adultery, you must read those passages carefully and note how she looked up at the master. Now, this is what I mean by preparation. She evidently, in looking up, expected something of the Christ Therefore, her consciousness was prepared for the Christ to enter and to purify and to forgive. Therefore, the master standing there, endowed with spiritual power, could do nothing for her until she looked up and virtually created a vacuum within herself in declaring her helplessness and almost hopelessness of the situation until she saw him, recognized the spiritual nature of his mission, and looked at him with pleading eyes, and in that very instant prepared herself for purification and for forgiveness. The thief on the cross prepared himself by his very recognition of the Christ beside him, by the very acknowledgement that the Christ had power. This was acknowledgement, recognition, preparation. So it is that as you study scripture, and I mean the scripture of all peoples, you will find the same thing, there is always preparation before the experience. You might take the uh, life of Gautama, who became the Buddha, and you will discover many years of preparation most of it in a wrong direction, but then ultimately sitting under the Bodhi tree, resting in silence, in an attitude of expectancy all night. This was his preparation, and then into that consciousness could come the revelation which has given so many forms of Buddhism to the world and has met the needs of countless millions. Read the experiences of the saints, of the sages, of the seers of scripture, and in every case you will find a, prepara a period of preparation. And that period of preparation enables us to receive the spirit which brings with it purification, forgiveness, and healing. Now, <clears throat> the key to this entire life of prayer or life of the spirit lies in this, that God is your individual consciousness. That is why the place whereon thou standest is holy ground, because your very consciousness is God. God is your very consciousness. Therefore, 
God at all times is closer to you than breathing. Closer to you than breathing. All that you have to do to receive God is to close your eyes. And right there, within your very consciousness, is the whole key to the kingdom of God. Because your consciousness, your individual consciousness, is the access to the whole of infinity. All of it. Immortality. Eternality. Infinite good. Infinite abundance of all good things is as available to you as the very space you occupy, closer to you than breathing. And your access to this infinity is through your own consciousness. In other words, even the woman taken in adultery did not have to go outside of herself to recognize and acknowledge the Christ. The thief on the cross did not have to go to holy mountains or holy temples, nor did he have to serve years and years of karma to be forgiven his crimes and to be taken this night into heaven. No, no, no. Not time, not space, not place. Here, where I am, though I mount up to heaven, though I make my bed in hell, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, thou art closer to me than breathing. The Spirit of God is within me, and the Master sought to make this so plain that no one would ever again believe that you had to give up your crops to the church or to God or that you had to serve time in purgatory or that you had to discover a holy mountain or a holy temple or a holy teacher. He tried to make it so clear that the kingdom of God is neither low here nor low there, but within you. Not within your feet, not within your stomach or your heart or your liver or your spinal cord. No, for this is not you. Your body is not you and you are not your body. But the kingdom of God, which is not within your body, is within you. And when you close your eyes, you will know that right there, somewhere in that darkness, you are. Now, here we come to a tremendous passage of Scripture one that holds the key. I stand at the door and knock. What are you supposed to do? What am I supposed to do? Open that door and invite the master. Speak, Lord, thy servant heareth. Just think now that closer to you than breathing am I. I, God, I, the Christ, stand at the door of your consciousness. And your consciousness is that door or access to I, infinity. And the moment that you say, speak, Lord, thy servant heareth. And even without speaking it, the moment that you open your ears as if to listen, or the moment that you look up 
as perhaps the woman taken in adultery did. In that moment, you are opening the door of your consciousness, and now the Christ, the Spirit of God, can flow in and purify, forgive, heal, redeem, supply. You remember what the Master said? I am come that you might have life and that you might have life more abundantly. And I stand at the door and knock. Therefore, if you want life, and if you want life more abundantly, you must open this door of your consciousness and admit the Christ. You remember in the 15th chapter of John, if you abide in me or if you let me abide in you, the Christ, you can only do this consciously. You can only do this through an act of your own consciousness. Now, see how different this is than taking thought for what you shall eat or what you shall drink or praying for food or clothing or raiment or automobiles or houses. The Master makes no mention of praying for those things. Only open the door and admit me, the Christ, the Spirit of God, the Son of God, and let me permeate your being. Let, me, let my life be your life. Let my blood be your blood. Let my spirit be your spirit. Let the bread of life which I am be the bread of your life. I am the staff of life. Let me be your staff. And you do this by an act of consciousness, by consciously opening yourself to the presence of God, the Spirit of God. And this is mysticism. This is living the mystical life because it is acknowledging that everything in the visible realm comes forth from the invisible. Everything that is made and everything that appears in the visible is made of the substance of the invisible. Now, in order to benefit fully by this, you must give up your concepts of God. It makes no difference what your idea of God is. Be assured of this, it is incorrect. It makes no difference how high it may be, how advanced it may be, it is incorrect. And the reason is that God is beyond a name. If you can name it, it isn't that. God is beyond form. Moses, long years before the Master, said, You shall not make unto yourselves any graven images. And he meant externally and internally. It is just as wrong to make a mental image of God or give God a mental name as it is to make a golden calf or a golden dollar. God is not to be found in names. As a matter of fact, any name of God, any synonym for God that you may be holding in your thought is a barrier to the God experience. God can be experienced, but God cannot be known by the mind, by seeing, hearing, tasting, touching, or smelling, because God is infinite beyond all human awareness. 
Therefore, only when you can acknowledge that God is infinite, and that would be beyond your comprehension since you cannot encompass infinity, that God is invisible and that takes God out of your sight, only then can you begin to perceive that God is closer to you than breathing. God is the very spirit within you. The spirit that permeates your consciousness, your soul, your spirit, your mind, and your body. God is this. God is the substance of which all the visible universe is formed. Just think of coming springtime, and you'll be planting in your garden, and you'll have many days seeds in your hand. And just remember that those seeds will remain seeds forever unless you bury them in their native soil and let an invisible war operate on them that will burst them open and enable them to take root and grow. The seeds of themselves will never be trees. They must be brought into contact with an invisible law that operates on them and in them and through them. And this produces in time the tree and the fruits. And so it is. We of ourselves, the Master reveals, we are nothing. Even I, Jesus, am nothing. If I speak of myself, I bear witness to a lie. I am nothing. But when the Spirit of God permeates me, I can feed multitudes, heal multitudes, even forgive sinners their sin. Not by any virtue of me, myself, but by virtue of the law, the Spirit of God, which I have permitted to enter my consciousness. Can I feed multitudes? And the Master says, no, I can of my own self do nothing. You see then that the mystical life really means admitting the invisible into your conscious experience that it may work through you and produce visibly the visible and so-called tangible universe. Then, the Master says, if you let me, this Spirit Christ, abide in you, you will bear fruit richly. Of course you will. Not by virtue of yourself, but by virtue now of the Spirit which is flowing in you and through you. And is evident to those with whom you come in contact, and even beyond this, the influence of your consciousness reaches around the globe. And if there is any one, or if there is any condition or circumstance, 10,000 miles away from you, of which you have no knowledge, be assured that as you open your consciousness, speak, Lord, thy servant heareth, then go about your business, you will discover in due time that that which is yours reaches you, even from thousands of miles. My own hear my voice, the Master said. Well, of course, he didn't want anybody else to hear his voice. He didn't want to cast pearls before swine. He didn't wish to give his gems to the unprepared thought. He only wanted those who could understand this message to be drawn to him. And they were. They came from every part of the Holy Land. And everyone before him and since who has been imbued with that same spirit has drawn unto themselves 
from throughout the world all that was necessary to their experience. You can't do it of yourself, nor can I. But that spirit, once it is permitted to come into my consciousness, it operates out here, and it draws to me all those who are mine. Not only people, circumstances, conditions, books, messages, whatever it is. Teacher, if I need a teacher, it will draw a teacher to me from this world or the worlds that have been or the worlds that are to come. Because nothing is impossible to God. Now, perhaps I should remind you of a little background. of why I am in this work and how it came about that I was brought to this work out of the business world. And it came about because there never was a doubt in my mind that there is a God. Somehow or other, I have never known a single day of my life when I haven't known that there was a God. But what I couldn't figure out was, how can there be a God and these sins on earth, or diseases on earth, or wars on earth, or man's inhumanity to man? How can these things be and there be a God? And this was the question that operated in my consciousness, and for the benefit of those of you who are in a hurry, let me tell you that this question came into my mind in 1909, in October or November, and that the answer came to me in November 1929. So don't be in too much of a hurry. The reason, of course, is that if you were to receive the answer before you're ready for it, you wouldn't recognize it. It would be like giving a problem in uh, Einstein's mathematics to me. It would do no good even if you supplied the answer. I wouldn't know what it is. Now, <clears throat> the answer that I received is this. There is no God on earth except through the consciousness of those who accept God and make way for God to function through. In other words, as Paul confirmed to me many years later, the natural man receiveth not the things of God. The natural man knoweth not the things of God. The natural man is not under the law of God. And so if you want to know why all the praying that goes on in the world is useless, there is the answer. Praying isn't the way, because there is no such God as you're praying to, nor does the real God have the capacity to do for you what you would like God to do for you. We'll come to that in a moment. But at this moment, let me remind you, that God can enter your experience only through you, only through your consciousness. You already have the kingdom of God within you, and as Browning tells us, you must open out a way for the imprisoned splendor to escape. There is no way to get God to come into you. You must open out a way for the God presence and God power, the kingdom of God, which is already within you. It was there before Abraham was. It was there before you were a picture in the mind of God. Because God has never created anything or anyone without his own spirit and life being within it. God gave his own life to his creation. Therefore, the kingdom of God for which you have been seeking 
all around the world like those who search for the Holy Grail. The kingdom of God will only be found when you're wearied of the search and give it up and sit down tired and then hear a little voice inside say, why didn't you look for me in here? This is where I've been all of the time, that you've been so busy out here. And even in this day of the spiritual and metaphysical world, there are people looking for God in books instead of trying to understand that when an individual is inspired by God, by the Spirit, to write a book, he can't put God in the book. And the only reason he writes a book is to remind you to go back to the kingdom of God within yourself. And you see when you go home, pick up any of the Infinite Way books and see if it tries to pretend that you are to find God in me or God in my books. And you'll discover that on every page it is telling you to go back to the kingdom within yourself. Every page is meant to force you back to the kingdom within yourself until eventually you have the experience and then you thank God for this book or for this author that led you back to the kingdom within yourself. And then you won't ever be tempted, if anyone takes up a collection to build a monument to me, you won't be tempted to contribute to it. The only monument I would like to have is the awareness that some, at least, were led back to the kingdom of God within themselves and discovered that the key is their own consciousness. Of course, temporarily, I or any of our teachers can serve as a help to you, as the Master did in his healing work, as the disciples did, as many healers have done over the centuries. But don't think for a minute that by their healing you or bringing forth some manner of good in your life that they have made your demonstration. Because, again, the secret the Master gave was, if I go not away, the Comforter will not come to you. If you are going to look to me forever and forever, or I think it is the Chinese who have that wonderful statement that if you are on a long journey and you come to a stream of water, you build yourself a raft. And you cross the stream to the other side. But don't put the raft on your shoulders and carry it any further. You won't need the raft on land. And so it is with your spiritual teacher or your spiritual books. Please remember that they are the rafts. They are the instruments. They are the helps that are given to us to lead us across the stream of life, across the problems of life, across the barriers that separate us from the land of heaven. But once we get over there, we won't need the raft. All we will need is communion. Pray without ceasing means commune within yourself. The God you are seeking is only to be found through your own consciousness. Your consciousness is the access to your health, to your wealth, to your happiness, to your peace, to your freedom. Don't think for a moment that armies can give you your freedom. Has ever, anyone ever had greater armies and navies than we've had in the last two or three wars that most of us remember? And have we gained freedom from those armies? No, we have gained 
imprisonment. We are now so imprisoned in our fear of bombs, in our fear of our former allies, the very allies we fed and sustained and armed, that we're imprisoned. The world is. I hope we individually aren't. But the world is imprisoned in a fear of those very people and those very armies and very navies that they created. The Bible foresaw this also when it said, put not your trust in horses and in arms. Because in the end, those who take up arms will be destroyed by those arms. But if you really seek peace for yourself, for others, for your neighbors, for your friends, for your enemies, for the world, seek peace, even world peace, within yourself. Because if you succeed, in making access to God through your consciousness, enough God will come through to free you and to free the world. Remember this, ten men who make access to God will free this entire world of its fears and of its wars. It isn't necessary that a million of you find God. No, it's only necessary that one, that one will establish the works. You might ask, why hasn't this been in the past? And the answer is this, that in all of the revelations of the past, we have not had the revelation until the infinite way of the word consciousness. This is the secret, this is the key, this is that which was unknown, the word consciousness. Consciousness is God, and the consciousness of one individual is just as much God as the consciousness of a million. In other words, when there were only one million people on earth, there was just as much of God as when there was a billion. And now that we have four billion, there is no more of God on earth than there was when there was only one man. For God is the consciousness of individual man. And therefore, one man with God is a majority. In fact, one man with God is a totality. And it is for this reason that when the Master said, my words will not pass away, I would actually believe that he said, my word will not pass away. My consciousness. And that eventually this consciousness will be recognized as not merely the consciousness of Jesus, but the consciousness of man. And once we realize that God is the soul of man, he's just as much the soul of one man as of one million men, and you do not multiply God by multiplying people. If you could, instead of a population explosion, we would call it a population blessing. The more children we have, the more God we will have. But unfortunately, that isn't true. The truth is, God is one. And when God appeared as Jesus, there was the totality of God in evidence. And Jesus knew it. Had we had an understanding of the word consciousness, it is possible that this may have been understood 
long before this, but we have made the mistake of personalizing. We have understood that Gautama was fully illumined as the Buddha, but we didn't know that the Buddha mind is the mind of man, not the mind of a man, but the mind of man. But when you and I begin to realize that God is individual consciousness, and this is the revelation of our original textbook, The Infinite Way, God is the consciousness of the individual. The totality of God is evident in every individual. Once you open your consciousness to admit the kingdom of God or make way for this imprisoned splendor to escape. Now, do not minimize God. Do not minimize yourself. On the other hand, do not inflate your ego by believing that any human being is God or even has an iota of God about them, because the natural man receiveth not the things of God. It is when the natural man, the thinking man, the reasoning man is still. Be still and know that I am God. Oh, take that passage right now. Close your eyes and say, be still. And know that I am God. And then go right on to, I am come, that ye might have life, life more abundant. I stand at the door and knock. I am the bread, the meat, the wine. I am life eternal. Do you see that that I is the center of your own being? And as you open your consciousness and admit that that I is God, now you can open your eyes and live your life. Don't try to change it. Don't try to move somewhere else or change your line of business or art or profession. Stay right where you are and let yourself be moved by that process. Just like the seed that you plant in the ground remains there and lets life act upon it and then life begins to force through the roots and uh, the shoots, eventually the tree and the blossoms and the fruit. But the seed has nothing to do with this. Life is operating in and through the seed and on all the way up to the fruitage. And so all you have to do is continue to lead the life that you are leading now with the exception of having enough periods during the day, even 30-second periods, to close your eyes unless you're driving an automobile, then keep them open. But even with them open, realize that word I. And say to it, speak, Father, speak, Lord, thy servant heareth, I am receptive to thy voice, then keep right on driving or whatever it is you're doing in the assurance that that life, that soul, that spirit of God, which you have allowed to permeate, fulfill you, it now is functioning. And you have done it through an act of your own consciousness. You haven't had to go anywhere or do anything. The mystical life, then, means that you are not to fear what mortal man can do to you, because you have the whole God power within you. 
Therefore, no weapon that is formed against you shall prosper. As a human being, I can assure you that every weapon formed against you can prosper, even a tiny little germ. But once you have opened your consciousness and let the Spirit of God flow from within you, it permeates every part of your body and being, permeates the blood and the bones and the brain and the muscle. Every bit of it is permeated with this spirit, this life. No weapon that is formed against you shall prosper. And you will be able to put up the sword, whether it was a mental sword or a physical sword. You will be able to stop doing mental protective work and do spiritual protective work. And the realization of the spiritual nature of your being because God constitutes your consciousness and through your consciousness you have access to the infinite grace of God, infinite power of God. No weapon that is formed against you can prosper. You need not fear mortal man or what he can do to you, nor need you depend on princes or favors or favoritism because you have access to infinity, immortality, eternality, divine grace within your own consciousness. You see then that the mystical life or the life of prayer and communion is really a communion that takes place within yourself. It is you communing with your real self, your greater self, your divine self, that part of you which the Master called the Father within, and which Paul called the indwelling Christ. The name you give to it is of no importance. It's only for identification. You have six children, and one of them is called John, and one Bill, and one Mary, but they're all equal in your sight. The name is merely a matter of identification, and so it is whether you say God or you say Father or you say Christ, it is of no importance as long as you mean the presence that is within you, the infinity, the invisible, which is the substance of all form, the substance of all the good that is to flow into your experience. Now. It is true that we get only what we give. In our human scene, there is a law operating of as ye sow, so shall ye reap. And if you sow sparingly, you will reap sparingly. Therefore, let your sowing be abundant, the sowing of forgiveness, the sowing of service, the sowing of benevolence. then the reaping is equally abundant because while we have the infinity of God within us, we have to let it out. And the secret of that was given to us in 12 baskets full that are always left over. But those 12 baskets full must be shared. They can't be allowed to accumulate moss, corruption. Now, I would like you to close your eyes so that you feel this withinness. In other words, realize that I have locked up within me the whole kingdom of God that I have been seeking externally. The whole realm of God that I've been going to holy places for, for expecting to find in holy books. All of this is locked up here within me, closer than breathing. And I know it because of the Master stating that I stand at the door and knock. 
I stand at your door and knock. I am come right here where you are, that you might have life and that you might have life abundantly. And so all that I have been seeking in the external, I now realize is locked up within me and my access to it is this inner communion. My own consciousness, my own listening ability, be still, listen for the still small voice. This very stillness and listening is my access to the infinity that I've been expecting to get by war, trickery, salesmanship, favoritism, power of some kind. And here it is. I have it. I have meat that the world knows not of. Here is a passage that should come to your conscious remembrance every time that a thought comes to you of some need that you have. Every time you believe you need something or someone, immediately go within and realize, no, 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 I have meat. The world knows not how. I have this life more abundant. You see, if I say I have a need, then I externalize need. And this, this should be clear to you through the story of the old Middle West, where we are told that when they were using mules that refused very often to work or to walk, that they took a bag of feed and attached it to a pole about 18 inches long and attached that to the harness on the neck of the uh, mule so that a bag of food was suspended about 18 inches away from them and the mule just kept walking and the food kept 18 inches in front of them. And just remember that. And just remember this, that every time we say, I need, we are a mule. And that which we need, we have harnessed 18 inches in front of us, and it will stay 18 inches in front of us as long as the word need is there. And fulfillment will only come when we can say, I know it, I know it, I have meat. Maybe at this moment it's invisible. Ah, oh, yes, we could go out in the park right now and look at a lot of trees that are barren. And if we judge from appearances, we'd be very, very fearful. But if only we stop to think for a moment, we will know that spring is coming. Just be patient and fulfillment will come on those trees. And so if we look at our bodies and find an absence of health or strength or youth, or if we look at our pocketbooks and find a lack of what we foolishly call supply, if we find in our lives a lack of companionship, let us stop being mulish about it and go back to our Christliness and realize that even though it is invisible at the moment, the principle of the Master is, I have meat the world knows not of. I have meat ye know not of. I am the bread of life. Not I need. Master never used words that had to do with a future tense. 
And that is why all spiritual truth is written in the present tense. I have, I am, God is. Now, those who advance far on the spiritual path have done so only because, by some miracle of grace, they have learned to live in the present. They have let the past go by, or oh, may refer to it once in a while just as an experience, but not as anything serious in their lives. They don't allow it to in influence or affect in any way the present. No matter how distressing the past may have been, no matter how disgraceful the past may have been, no matter how difficult the past may have been, a person is foolishness who allows that to influence today. It's gone, it's dead. Some people have even lived 80 or 90 years and they are letting that fact spoil their today by dwelling in how many years of the past there may be and counting how few there are left in the future. Whereas there would be more in the future if they'd stop living in the future which is impossible. Now, now I and my father are one. Now what has that to do with the yesterdays in which I didn't know that? Now, since I and the father are one, son, thou art ever with me, all that I have is thine. That has nothing to do with the yesterdays when I didn't know it. My concern is with the fact that I now know that I and the Father are one and that all that the Father hath is mine. And so I'm going to live in that consciousness. And so somebody brings up about tomorrow. Well, first place, I haven't gotten there. Second place, I don't know where I'll be tomorrow or if. My concern is now right now. The only thing I have to do with tomorrow is that because of today there are certain things that will automatically come up to be done tomorrow and I will do them tomorrow. I will not try to do them yesterday or today. Sufficient unto tomorrow is what has to be done tomorrow. Now, as you advance on the spiritual path, you will discover this, that the past fades out except as a conversation piece. But it has no bearing on your present life. It has no presence or power. You don't give it jurisdiction. You don't allow the fact that you didn't have as much education as somebody else to have weight. You don't allow the fact that somebody else had more money or has Nothing that concerns the past has to do with you. It is living in the now. Now, I open the door of my consciousness because I stand at the door and knock and I admit the Christ, the presence of God, into my consciousness and I live now and then I let that work in me as I go about my daily task. And now we're going to have a few minutes of rest, I guess.